Volume two, chapter nine of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume two, chapter nine. Love, how it sells poor bliss for proud despair. Shelley. It was Sunday morning, and it was something more. There was a subtle change in the air, a mystery in the sunshine. Autumn and summer were met in tremulous wedlock. But the hand of the bride trembled in the bridegrooms. In the rapture of bridal there was a prophecy of parting and death. The birds knew it. In the songless silence the robin was practising his autumn reverie. Joy and sadness were blent together in the solemn beauty of transition. The voice of the brook was sunk to a whisper to-day. Through the still air the tangled voices of the church bells came from the little grey church in the valley. A rival service was going on in the rookery on Moat Hill, in which the congregation joined with hoarse unanimity. Miss Fane did not go to church in the morning, so John and Di went together down the steep path through the wood, across the park, over the village beck, and up the low, hollowed steps into the churchyard. Overly was a primitive place. The little congregation was sitting on the wall, or standing about among the tilted tombstones, according to custom, to see John and the clergyman come in. And then there was a general clump and clatter after them into church. The bell stopped, and the service began. Di and John sat at a little distance from each other in the carved Tempest pew. The Tempests were an overbearing race. The little rough stone church with its round Norman arches was a memorial of their race. Lord, thou hast been our refuge from one generation to another, was graven in the stones of the wall just before Di's eyes. Beneath was a low arch surmounting the tomb of a knight in effigy. Beyond there were more tombs and arches. The building was thronged with the sculptured dead of one family. It was a mortuary chapel in itself. Tattered flags hung where pious hands, red with infidel blood, had fastened them. With a simple confidence in their own importance, and the approval of their Creator, the Tempests had raised their memorials and hung their battered swords in the house of their God. The very son himself smote, not through the gaudy figures of Scripture story, but through the painted arms of the Morbys, of the penniless, pious Morby, who sold his land to his clutching Tempest brother-in-law in order to get out to the Crusades. Had God really been their refuge from all those bygone generations to this? Di wondered. In these latter days of millionaire cheesemongers who dwell ageless in the feudal castles of the poor, what wonder if the faith even of the strongest waxes cold? She looked fixedly at John as he went to the reading-desk and stood up to read the first lesson. It was difficult to believe the dead were not listening too, that the Knight Templar, lying in armour, with his drawn sword beside him and broken hands joined, did not turn his head a little, pillowed so uncomfortably on his helmet, to hear John's low, clear voice. And, as John read, a feeling of pride in him, not unmixed with awe, arose in Di's mind. All he did and said, even when in his gentlest mood, and Di had not as yet seen him in any other, had a hint of power in it. Power restrained, perhaps, but existent. How strong his iron hand looked touching the book! She could more easily imagine it grasping a sword-hilt. He stood before her as the head of the race, his rugged profile and heavy jaws silhouetted in all their native strength and ugliness against the uncompromising light of the eastern window. She looked at him, and was glad. He will do us honour, she said to herself. Someone else was watching John, too. I will arise and go to my father, John read. And Mr. Goodwin closed his eyes and prayed the old worn prayer. Our prayers for others are mainly tacit reproaches to the Almighty, that God would touch John's heart. Humanity has many sides, but perhaps none more incomprehensible than that represented by the patient middle-aged man leaning back in his corner and praying for John's soul. None more difficult to describe without an appearance of ridicule. For certain aspects of character, like some faces, 
lend themselves to caricature more readily than to a portrait. Mr. Goodwin was one of that class of persons who belong so entirely to a class that it is difficult to individualise them, whose peculiar object in life is to stick in clusters like limpets to existing, and especially to superseded, forms of religion. Their whole constitution and central ganglion consists of one adhesive organism. The quality of that to which they adhere does not appear to affect them, provided it is stationary. To their constitution movement is torture, uprootal is death. It would be impossible to chip Mr. Goodwin from his rock and hold him up to the scrutiny of the reader without distorting him to a caricature, which is an insult to our common nature. And as he is in the full exercise of his adhesive muscle in company with large numbers of his kind, he is nothing and even then he is not much. Not much? Ah, oh, yes, he is. His class has played an important part in all crises of religious history. It was instrumental in the crucifixion of Christ. It called a new truth blasphemy as fiercely then as now. By its law, truth, if new, must ever be put to death. But when Christianity took form, this class settled on it nevertheless, adhered to it as strictly as its forebears had done to the Jewish ritual. It was this class which resisted, and would have burned out the Reformation. But when the Reformation gained bulk enough for it to stick to, it spread itself upon its surface in due course, as it still does today. Let who will sweat and agonize for the sake of a new truth, or a newer and purer form of an old one? There will always be those who will stand aside and coldly regard if they cannot crush, the struggle and the heartbreak of the pioneers, and then will enter into the fruit of their labours, and complacently point in later years to the advance of thought in their time, which they have done nothing to advance, but to which, when sanctioned by time and custom and the populace, they will adhere. John shut the book, and Mr. Goodwin, taken up with his own mournful reflections, heard no more of the service until he was wakened by the shriek of the village choir. Before Jehovah's awful throne ye nations bow with sacred joy. When the clergyman had blessed his flock, and the flock had hurried with his blessing into the open air, Diane John remained behind to look at the nibbled old stone font, engraved with tangled signs and unknown beasts with protruding unknown tongues, where little tempests had whimpered and protested against a Christianity they did not understand. The aisle and chancel were paved with worn lettered stones, obliterated memorials of forgotten tempests who had passed at midnight with flaring torches from their first home on the crag to their last in the valley. The walls bore record, too. John had put up a tablet to his predecessor. It contained only the name and date of birth and death, and underneath the single sentence, Until the day break and the shadows flee away. Di read the words in silence, and then turned the splendour of her deep glance upon him. Since when had the bare fact of meeting her eyes become so exceeding sharp and sweet such an epoch in the day? John writhed inwardly under their gentle scrutiny. "'You are very loyal,' she said. He felt a sudden furious irritation against her, which took him by surprise, and then turned to scornful anger against himself. He led the way out of the church into the sad September sunshine, and talked of indifferent subjects till they reached the castle. And after luncheon John went to the library and stared at the shelves again, and Miss Fane ambled and grunted to church, and Di sat with her grandmother. There are some acts of self-sacrifice for which the performers will never in this world obtain the credit they deserve. Mrs. Courtney who was addicted to standing proxy for Providence, and was not afraid to take upon herself responsibilities which belonged to omniscience alone, had not hesitated to perform such an act, in the belief that the cause justified the means. Indeed, in her eyes, a good cause justified many sorts and conditions of means. All Saturday and half Sunday she had repressed the pangs of a healthy appetite, and had partaken only of the mutton broth and splintered toast of invalidism. With a not ill-grounded dread lest Di's quick eyes should detect a subterfuge, she had gone so far as to take 
heart drops three times a day from the hand of her granddaughter, and had been careful to have recourse to her tin of arrowroot biscuits only in the strictest privacy. But now that Sunday afternoon had come, she felt that she could safely relax into convalescence. The blinds were drawn up, and she was established in an armchair by the window. "'You seem really better,' said Di. "'I should hardly have known you'd had one of your attacks. "'You generally look so pale afterwards.' "'It has been very slight,' said Mrs. Courtney, blushing faintly. "'I took it in time. "'I shall be able to travel to-morrow. "'I suppose you and Miss Fane went to church this morning?' "'Miss Fane would not go, but John and I did.' Mrs. Courtney closed her eyes. Virtue may be its own reward, but it is gratifying when it is not the only one. "'Granny,' said Di suddenly, "'I never knew till John told me that my mother had been engaged to his father.' "'What has John been raking up these old stories for?' "'I don't think he raked up anything. He seemed to think I knew all about it. He was showing me my mother's miniature, when she had found among his father's papers. I always supposed that the reason you never would talk about her was because you had felt her death too much. "'I was glad when she died,' said Mrs. Courtney. "'Was she unhappy, then? "'Father speaks of her rather sadly when he does mention her, "'as if he'd been devoted to her, but she had not cared much for him, "'and had felt aggrieved at his being poor. "'He once said he had many faults, but that was the one she could never forgive. "'And he told me that when she died he was away on business, "'and she did not leave so much as a note or a message for him.' "'It is quite true she did not.' said Mrs. Courtney, in a suppressed voice. "'I have never talked to you about your mother, Di, because I knew if I did I should prejudice you against your father, and I have no right to, to do that.' "'I think,' said Di, "'that now I know a little you had better tell me the rest, or I shall only imagine things were worse than the reality.' So Mrs. Courtney told her, told her of the little daughter who had been born to her in the first desolation of her widowhood, round whom she had wrapped in its entirety the love that many women divide between husbands and sons and daughters. She told I of young Mr. Tempest, then just coming forward in political life, between whom and herself a friendship had sprung up in the days when he had been secretary to her brother, then in the ministry. The young man was constantly at her house. He was serious, earnest, diffident, ambitious. Di reached the age of seventeen, Mrs. Courtney saw the probable result, and hoped for it. With some person to hope for anything is to remove obstacles from the path of its achievement. "'And yet, Di,' said Mrs. Courtney, "'I can't reproach myself. They were suited to each other. It is as clear to me now as it was then. She did not love him, but I knew she would, and she had seen no one else, and he worshipped her. I threw them together.' but I did not press her to accept him. She did accept him, and we went down to Overly together. She had this room. I remembered it directly I saw it again. The engagement had not been formally given out, and the wedding was not to have been till the following spring on account of her youth. I think Mr. Tempest and I were the two happiest people in the world. I felt such entire confidence in him and I was thankful she should not run the gauntlet of all that a beautiful girl is exposed to in society. She was as innocent as a child of ten, and as unconscious of her beauty, which, poor child, was very great. And then he, your father, came to Overley. Ten days afterwards they went away together, and I, I who had never been parted from her for a night since her birth, I never saw her again except once across a room at a party, until four years afterwards when her first child was born. I went to her then. I tried not to go, for she did not send for me, but she was the only child I had ever had, and I remembered my own loneliness when she was born. And the pain of staying away became too great, and I went, and she was quite changed. She was not the least like my child, except about the eyes, and she was taller. Mr. Tempest never forgave her, because he loved her, but I forgave her at last, because I loved her more than he did. I saw her often after that. She used to, to tell me when your father would be away, and he was much away, and then I went to her. I would not meet him. 
we never spoke of her married life. It did not bear talking about, for she had really loved him, and it took him a long time to break her of it. We talked of the baby and servants and the price of things, for she was very poor. She was loyal to her husband. She never spoke about him except once. I remember that day. It was one of the last before she died. I found her sitting by the fire reading Consuelo. I sat down by her, and we remained a long time without speaking. Often we sat in silence together. You have not come to the places on the road, my dear, when somehow words are no use any more, and the only poor comfort left is to be with someone who understands and says nothing. When you do, you will find silence one degree more bearable than speech. At last she turned to the book and pointed to a sentence in it. I can see the page now, and the tall French print. The caricature de cet homme entraîne les actions de sa vie. Jamais tu ne l'as déchangé. I think that is true, she said. Some characters seem to be settled beforehand, like a weathercock with its leaded tail. They cannot really change, because they are always changing. Nothing teaches them. Happiness, trouble, love, and hate bring no experience. They swing round to every wind that blows on one pivot always, themselves. There was a time when I was afraid I tired God with one name. Jamais tu ne le changerai. No, never. One changes oneself. That is all. And now, instead of reproaching others, I reproach myself, bitterly, bitterly. And she never begged my pardon. She once said, when I found her very miserable, that it was right that one who had made others suffer should suffer too. But those were the only times she alluded to the past, and I never did. I did not go to her to reproach her. The kind of people who are cut by reproaches have generally reproached themselves more harshly than anyone else can. She had, I know. It would have been better if she had been less reserved, and if she could have taken more interest in little things, but she did not seem able to. Some women, and they are the happy ones, can comfort themselves in a loveless marriage with pretty note-paper, and tying up the legs of chairs with blue ribbon. She could not do that, and I think she suffered more in consequence. Those little feminine instincts are not given us for nothing. She never gave in until she knew she was dying. Then she tried to speak, but she sank rapidly. She said something about you, and then smiled when her voice failed her and gave up the attempt. I think she was so glad to go that she did not mind anything else much. They held the baby to her as a last chance and made it cry. Oh, die, how you cried! And she trembled very much, just for a moment and they did not seem to take any more notice, though they put its little hand against her face. I think the end came all the quicker. It seemed too good to be true at first. Don't cry, my dear. Young people don't know where trouble lies. They think it is in external calamity and sickness and death. But one does not find it so. The only real troubles are those which we cause each other through the affections. Those whom we love chasten us. I never shed a single tear for her when she died. There had been too many during her life, for I loved her better than anything in the world, except my husband, who died when he was twenty-five and I was twenty-two. You often remind me of him. You are a very dear child to me. She said she hoped you would make up a little to me, and you have, not a little. I have brought you up differently. I saw my mistake with her. I sheltered her too much. I hope I have not run into the opposite extreme with you. I have allowed you more liberty than is usual, and I have encouraged you to look at life for yourself, and to think and act for yourself, and learn by your own experience. I now go and bathe your eyes, and see if you can find me Fitzgerald's Emma Khayyam. I think I saw it last in the morning-room. John and I were talking about it on Friday. I dare say he will know where it is. End of Volume 2 Chapter 9Volume two, chapter ten of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Two, Chapter Ten. Si tu ne m'aimes pas, moi je t'aime. It was the time of afternoon tea. Miss Fane rolled off the sofa and, with a hydraulic sniff that contemporarily suspended the laws of nature, proceeded to pour out tea. Presently, John and the dogs came in, and Di, who had found Mrs. Courtney's book without his assistance, followed. John had not the art of small talk. Miss Fane, who was in the habit of attempting the simultaneous absorption of liquid and farinaceous nutriment with a perseverance not marked by success, was necessarily silent, save when a caraway seed took the wrong turn. She seldom spoke in the presence of food, any more than others do in church. Few things, apart from the bull of Basham, commanded Miss Fane's undivided homage, but food never failed to, though it was reserved for plover's eggs and the row of the sturgeon to stir the late demotion of her nature to its depths. The dogs did their tricks. Linda contrived to swallow all his own and half Fritz's portion, but, fortunately for the cause of justice, during a muffin-scattering choke on Linda's part, Fritz's long red tongue was able to glean together fragments of what he imagined he had lost sight of for ever. Di inquired whether there were evening service. "'Evening service at seven, said Miss Fane. "'Supper at a quarter-past eight. "'Do not go to church again,' said John. "'Come for a walk with me.' Di readily agreed. It was very pleasant to her to be with John. She had begun to feel that he and she were near akin. He was her only first cousin. The nearness of their relationship, accounting as it did in her mind for a growing intimacy, prevented any suspicion of that intimacy having sprung from another source. They walked together, through the forest, in the still opal light of the waning day. Through the enlacing fingers of the trees the western sun made ladders of light. Breast high among the bracken they went, disturbing the deer, across the heather, under the whisper of the pines, down to the steel-white reeded pools below. They sat down on the trunk of a fallen tree, and a faint air came across the water from the trees on the further side, with a message to the trees on this. Neither talked much. The lurking sadness in the air just touched and soothed the lurking sadness in Di's mind. She did not notice John's silence, for he was often silent. She wound a blade of grass round her finger, and then unwound it again. John watched her do it. He had noticed before, as a peculiarity of Di's, not observable in other women, that whatever she did was interesting. She asked some question about the lower pool gleaming before them through the trunks of the trees, and he answered absently the reverse of what was true. "'Then perhaps we'd better be turning back,' she said. He rose, and they went back another way, climbing slowly up and up by a little winding track through steepest forest places. Many burrs left their native stems to accompany them on the way. They had showed to great advantage on Di's primrose cotton gown. At last they reached the top of the rocky ridge, and she sat down, out of breath, under a group of silver firs, and, taking off her gloves, began idly to pick the burrs one by one off the folds of her gown. There was no hurry. He sat down by her and watched her hands. She put the burrs on a stone near her. They were sitting on the topmost verge of the crag, and the forest fell away in a shimmer of green beneath their feet to the pools below, and then climbed the other side of the valley and melted into the purple of the Overly and Ulston moors. Far away, the steep ridge of Hambleton and the headland of Sutton Brow stood out against the evening sky. Some tempest of bygone days had dared to perpetrate a Greek temple in a clearing among the silver firs where they were sitting, but time had effaced that desecration of one of God's high places by transforming it to a lichened ruin of scattered stones. It was on one of these scattered stones that Di was raising a little cairn of burrs. Forty-one! she said at last. You have not even begun your toilet yet, John. No answer. The sun was going down unseen behind a bar of cloud. A purple light was on the hills. 
Their faces showed that they saw the glory, for the twilight deepened over all the nearer land. Slowly the sun passed below the leaden bar, and looked back once more in full heaven, and drowned the world in light. Then with dying strength he smote the leaden bar to one long line of quivering gold, and sank dimly, redly, to the enshrouding west. All colour died. The hills were gone, the land lay dark. But far across the sky, from north to south, the line of light remained. Di had watched the sunset alone. John had not seen it. His eyes were fixed on her calm face with the western glow upon it. She did not even notice that he was looking at her. One of her ungloved hands lay on her knee, so near to him, yet so immeasurably far away. Could he stretch across the gulf to touch it? His expressionless face took some meaning at last. He leaned a little towards her, and laid his hand on hers. She started violently, and dropped her sunset thought like a surprised child its flowers. Even a less vain man than John might have been cut to the quick by the sudden horrified bewilderment of her face, and of the dazzled light-blinded eyes which turned to peer at him with such unseeing distress. "'Oh, John,' she said, "'not you!' And she put her other hand quickly for one second on his. "'Yes,' he said, "'that is just it.' Her mouth quivered painfully. "'I thought,' she said, "'we were... "'Surely we are friends.' "'No,' said John, "'mastering the insane emotion "'which had leapt within him "'at the touch of her hand. "'We never were, and we never shall be. "'I will have nothing to do "'with any friendship of yours. "'I am not a beggar "'to be shaken off with coppers. "'I want everything or nothing.' "'Her manner changed. "'Her self-possession came back. "'I am sorry. "'It must be nothing,' "'she said gently. And she tried quietly but firmly to withdraw her hand. His grasp on it tightened ever so little, but in an unmistakable manner, and she instantly gave up the attempt. A splendid colour mounted slowly to her face. She drew herself up. Her lightning bright, intrepid eyes met his without flinching. They looked hard at each other in the waning light. Once again they seemed to measure swords as at the moment when they first met. Each felt the other formidable. There was no slightest shred of disguise between them. There was a breathless silence. Di went through a frightful revulsion of mind. The sunset and the light along the sky seemed to have betrayed her. These pleasanter days had been in league against her, and now, goaded by the grasp of his hand on hers, her mind made one headlong rush at the goal towards which these accomplices had been luring her. Where were they leading her? Glamour dropped dead. Marriage remained. To become this man's wife, to merge her life in his, to give up everything into the hand that still held hers, the pressure of which was like a claim. He had only laid his hand upon her hand, but it seemed to her that he had laid it upon her soul. Her whole being rose up against him in sudden, passionate antagonism, horrible to bear. And all the time she knew instinctively that he was stronger than she. John saw and understood that mental struggle almost with compassion, yet with an exultant sense of power over her. One conviction of the soul ever remains unshaken, that whom we understand is ours to have and to hold. He deliberately released her hand. She did not make the slightest movement at regaining possession of it. John wrestled with his voice, and forced it back, harsh and unfamiliar, to do his bidding. "'Die,' he said. "'I believe in truth, even between men and women. I know what you are feeling about me at this moment. Well, that, even that, is better than a mistake. And you were making one. You had not the faintest suspicion of what has been the one object of my life since the day I first met you. The fault was mine, not yours. You could not see what was not on the surface to be seen.' You would have gone on for the remainder of your natural life, liking me in a way I—I I cannot tolerate if I had not done as I did. I have not the power, like some men, of showing their feelings. I can't say the little things and do the little things that come to others by instinct. My instinct is to keep things to myself. I always have, till now. 
silence again, a silence which seemed to grow in a moment to such colossal dimensions that it was hardly credible a voice would have power to break it. The twilight had advanced suddenly upon them. The young pheasants crept and called among the bracken. The night-birds passed swift and silent as sudden thoughts. Di struggled with an unreasoning, furious anger, which, like a fiery horse, took her whole strength to control. "'I love you,' said John, "'and I shall go on loving you, and it is better you should know it.' And as he spoke she became aware that her anger was but a little thing beside his. "'What is the good of telling me?' she said. "'What I—' "'What you know I don't wish to hear.' "'What good?' said John fiercely, his face working. "'Great God, do you imagine I have put myself through the torture of making myself intolerable to you for no purpose? Do you think that you can dismiss me with a few angry words? What, what good? The greatest good in the world which I would turn heaven and earth to win, which, please God, I will win.' Di became as white as he. He was too strong, this man, with his set face and clenched, trembling hand. She was horribly frightened, but she kept a brave front. She turned towards him and would have spoken, but her lips only moved. "'You need not speak,' he said more gently. "'You cannot refuse what you have not been asked for. I ask nothing of you. Do you understand? Nothing. When I ask it, will be time enough to refuse. It's getting late. Let us go home.' End of Volume 2 Chapter 10。Volume Two, Chapter Eleven of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume Two, Chapter Eleven. Those who have called the world profane, have succeeded in making it so. J. H. Tom. The dreams of youth and love so frequently fade unfulfilled into the light of common day, that it is a pleasure to be able to record that Madeline saw the greater part of hers realised. She was received with what she termed éclat in her new neighbourhood. She remarked with complacency that everybody made much too much of her, that she had been quite touched by the enthusiasm of her reception. It was an ascertained fact that she would open the hunt ball with the President a point on which her maiden meditation had been much exercised. The Duchess of Southwark was among the first to call upon her. If that lady's principal motive in doing so was curiosity to see what kind of wife Sir Henry, or, as he was called in his own county, the Solicitor-General, had at length procured, Madeleine was comfortably unaware of the fact. After that single call, the duration of which was confined to nine minutes, Madeline spoke of the Duchess as kindness and cordiality itself. She was invited to stay at Alvary, and afterwards to fill her house for a fancy ball in October, in honour of the coming of age of Lord Elva, the Duke's eldest son and chief thorn in the flesh, a young man of great promise, when you got to know him, as Madeline averred, in which case few shared that advantage with her. Other invitations poured in. The neighbourhood was really surprised at the grace and beauty of the bride, considering. It was soon rumoured that she was a saint as well, that she read prayers every morning at Cantaloupe, which the stablemen were expected to attend, and that she taught in the Sunday school. The ardent young vicar of the parish, who had hitherto languished unsupported and misunderstood at Sir Henry's door, in the flapping draperies that so well become the church militant, was enthusiastic about her. She was what he called a true woman. Those who use this expression best know what it means. Processions and monster candles, crucifixes, and other ingredients of the pharmacopoeia of religion swam before his mental vision. The little illegal side-altar to which his two crosses, namely the church wardens, had objected, but without which his soul could not rest in peace, was reinstated after a conversation with Madeline. A promise on that lady's part to embroider an altar-cloth for the same was noised abroad. Sir Henry was jubilant at his wife's popularity, which lost nothing from her own comments on it. 
Although nearly six months had elapsed since his marriage, he was still in a state of blind adoration, an adoration so blind that none of the ordinary events by which disillusion begins had any power to affect him. He was not conscious that once or twice during the season in London he had been duped, that the jealousy which had flamed up so suddenly against Archie Tempest had more grounds than the single note he found in his wife's pocket, when in a fit of clumsy fondness he turned out all its contents on her knee, solely to cogitate a wonder over them. He had a habit, which tried her more than his slow faculties had any idea of, of examining Madeline's belongings. His admiring curiosity had no suspicion in it. He liked to look at them solely because they were hers. One day, shortly after their arrival at Cantaloupe, when he was sitting in stolid inconvenient sympathy in her room, whether she had vainly retreated from him on the plea of a headache, he occupied himself by opening the drawers of her dressing-table, one after the other, investigating with aboriginal interest small boxes of hairpins, curling irons, and that various assortment of feminine gear which the hairdresser elegantly designates as toilet requisites. At last he peeped into a box where, carefully arranged side by side, were the dearest of curls on tortoiseshell combs which he had often seen on his wife's head, and some smaller, much becrimped bodies which filled him with wondering dislike, hair caricatured, frisette. "'What are you doing?' said Madeline, faintly, lying on the sofa with her back to him, holding her salts to her nose. "'Oh, if only he would go away, this large, dreadful man, and leave her half an hour in peace, without hearing him clear his throat and sniff.' On the contrary, he came and sat down by her, chuckling, holding the curls and frisette in his thick hands. She dropped her smelling bottle and looked at them in an outraged silence. Was there then no sanctity, no privacy in married life? Was everything about her to be made common and profane? She hated Sir Henry at that moment. As long as he had remained an invoice accompanying the arrival of coveted possessions, she had felt only a vague uneasiness about him. Directly he became, after the wedding, a heavy bill demanding cash payment to account rendered, she found that the marriage market is not a very cheap one after all. Sir Henry was not the least chagrined at a discovery which might have tried the devotion of a more romantic lover. "'Why, Maddy,' he said, "'you're much too young and pretty to wear this sort of toggery. Leave them to the old dowagers, my dear.' And he dropped them in the fire. She saw them burn but she made no sign. Presently, however, when he had left her, she began to cry feebly, for even feminine fortitude has its limits. She was in reality satisfied with her marriage, on the whole, though she was wiping away a few natural tears at this moment. But in this class of union there is generally one item which is found almost intolerable, namely the husband. He really was the only drawback in this case the furniture, the house, the southern aspect of the reception-rooms, everything else was satisfactory. The park was handsomer than she had expected, and she had not known there was a silver dinner-service. It had been a love-match as far as that was concerned. If Henry himself had only been different, Madeline often reflected, if he had not been so red, and if he had had curly hair, or any hair at all, but whose lot has not some secret sorrow? So Madeline cried a little, and then wiped her eyes, and fell to thinking of her gown for the fancy ball at Alvary next month. She called to mind Di's height and regal figure with a pang. Perhaps after all she had been unwise in asking her dear friend, whom it would be difficult to eclipse, for this particular ball. Madeline was under the impression that she was having Di out of good nature. This was her tame, caged motive, kept for the inspection of others, especially of Di. Nevertheless, there were others which were none the less genuine, because they did not wait to have salt put on their tails, and invariably flew away at the approach of strangers. Madeline had not remembered to be good-natured, until a certain obstacle to the completion of her ball-party, as she intended it, had arisen. The subject of young men was one which she had approached with the utmost delicacy, for, according to Sir Henry, all young men, at least all good-looking ones, were fools and oafs whom he was not going to have wounding his birds. 
She agreed with him entirely, but reminded him of the Duchess's solemn injunction to bring a party of even numbers. Sir Henry at last gave in so far as to propose an elderly colonel. Madeleine in turn suggested Lord Hemsworth, who was allowed to be a good sort, and was invited. "'Then we ought to have Miss Di Tempest if we have Hemsworth,' said Sir Henry, blowing like a grampus, as was his manner, in moments of inspiration. "'I'm quite a matchmaker now I marry myself. Ask her to meet him, Maddy. She's your special pal, ain't she?' Madeline felt that she required a strength greater than her own to bear with a person who says ain't and a good sort, and designates her lady friend as a pal. She pressed the silver knob of her pencil to her lips. There was, she remarked, no one whom she would like to have so much as die, but Mr. Lumley was her next suggestion, and Sir Henry slapped himself on the leg and said he was the very thing. "'We want one other man.' said Madeline reflectively, after a few more had passed through the needle's eye of Sir Henry's criticism. "'Let me see. Oh, there's Captain Tempest. He dances well.' "'I won't have him,' said Sir Henry at once, his eyes assuming their most prawn-like expression. "'He may have his cousin, if you like, the owl with the jowl, as Lumley calls him, Tempest of Overley.' "'He's sure to be asked to the house itself, being a relation,' said Madeline, dropping the subject of Archie instantly. She did not recur to it again. But after their return home from the visit to the Hemsworths, of which she had met Di, she told her husband she had invited Di for the fancy ball, as he had wished her to do. "'Me?' said Sir Henry Redding. "'Lord, bless me, what do I want with her?' And it was some time before he could be made to recollect what he had said nearly a month ago about asking Di to meet Lord Hemsworth. "'You forget your own wishes more quickly than I do,' she said, putting her hand in his. He did, by Jove, he did. And he bent over the little hand and kissed it, while she noticed how red the back of his neck was. When he became unusually apoplectic in appearance, as at this moment, Madeline always caught a glimpse of herself as a young widow, and the idea softened her towards him. If he were once really gone, without any possibility of return, she felt that she could have said, Poor Henry. The only awkward part about having asked Di said Madeline, after a pause, is that Mrs. Courtney doesn't allow her to visit alone. "'Well, my dear, ask Mrs. Courtney. I like her. She's always been very civil to me.' She had indeed. "'I don't like her very much myself,' said Madeline. "'She's so worldly, and I think she's made die so, and she would be the only older person. You know you decided it should be a young party this time. It's very awkward die not being able to come alone at her age.' She evidently wanted me to ask her brother to bring her, who, she almost told me, was anxious to meet Miss Crupps, the carpet heiress, but I did not quite like to ask him without your leave. "'Oh, ask him by all means,' said Sir Henry, entirely oblivious of his former refusal. "'After that poor little girl, is he? Well, we'll sit out together and watch the love-making, eh?' Madeline experienced a tremor, wholly unmixed with compunction at gaining her point. She would have been aware, if she had read it in a book, that any one who had acted as she had done had departed from the truth in suggesting that Di could not visit alone. She would have felt also that it was reprehensible in the extreme to invite to her house a man who had secretly, though not without provocation, made love to her since her marriage. But just in the same way that what we regret as conceit in others we perceive to be a legitimate self-respect in ourselves, so Madeline as on previous occasions, saw things very differently. She was incapable of what she called a low view. She had often, frankly, told herself that she took a deep interest in Archie. She had put his initials against some of her favourite passages in her Morocco manual. She prayed for him on his birthday, and sometimes when she woke up and looked at her luminous cross at night. She believed that she had a great influence for good over him which it was her duty to use. She was sincere in her wish to proselytize, but the sincerity of an insincere nature is like the kernel of a deaf nut, a mere shred of undeveloped fibre. What Madeline wished to believe became a reality to her. Gratification of a very common form of vanity was a religious duty. She wrote to Archie with a clear conscience, and, when he accepted, 
had a box of autumn hats sent down from London. End of Volume 2, Chapter 11volume 2 chapter 12 of diana tempest by mary chumley this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by simon evers volume 2 chapter 12 o oh, love's but a dance where time plays the fiddle see the couples advance o oh, love's but a dance a whisper a glance shall we twirl down the middle o oh, love's but a dance where time plays the fiddle austin dobson it was the night of the fancy-dress ball. The carriages were already at the door, and could be heard crunching round and round upon the gravel. Sir Henry, all yeomanry red and gold, was having the bursting hooks and eyes at his throat altered in his wife's room. Something had to be done to his belt, too. At last he went, blushing, downstairs before the cluster of maids, with his sword under his arm. The guests, who had gone up to dress after an early dinner, were reappearing by degrees. Lord Hemsworth, in claret-coloured coat and long Georgian waistcoat and tie-wig, came down, some and quiet as usual, with his young sister, whose imagination had stopped short at cotton-wool snowflakes on a tulle skirt. An impecunious young man in a red hunt-coat rushed in, hooted on the stairs by Mr. Lumley for having come without a wedding garment. Madeline sailed down in Watteau costume. Two married ladies followed in Elizabethan ones. Presently Archie made his appearance, a dream of beauty in white satin from head to foot, as the Earl of Leicester, his curling hair, fair to whiteness, looking like the wig, which it was not. Everyone, men and women alike, turned to look at him, and Mr. Lumley, following in Harlequin costume, was quite overlooked, until he turned a somersault, saying, "'Here we are again!' whereat Sir Henry instantly lost a hook and eye in a cackle of admiration." "'We ought to be starting,' said Madeline. "'We're all down now.' "'Not quite all,' said Mr. Lumley, sinking on one knee, as Di came in, crowned and sceptred, in a green and silver gown edged with ermine. Lord Hemsworth drew in his breath. Madeline's face fell. "'Good gracious, Di,' she said, with a very thin laugh, "'this is dressing up indeed.' The party, already late, got under way, Mr. Lumley, of course, calling in falsetto to each carriage in turn not to go without him, and then refusing to enter any vehicle in which, as he expressed it, Miss Tempest was not already an ornamental fixture. "'This is getting beyond a joke,' said Lord Hemsworth, as a burst of song issued from the carriage leaving the door, and the lamp inside showed Di's crowned head, Sir Henry's violet complexion, and the gutta-percha face of the warbling Mr. Lumley. Di sat very silent in her corner, and after a time, as the drive was a long one, the desultory conversation dropped, and Sir Henry fell into a nasal slumber, from which, as Madeline was in another carriage, no one attempted to rouse him. Di shut her eyes as a safeguard against being spoken to, and her mind went back to the subject which had been occupying much of her thoughts since the previous evening, namely, the fact that she should meet John at the ball. She knew he would be there, for she had seen him get out of the train at Alvary Station the afternoon before. She had found on a previous occasion, when they had suddenly been confronted with each other at the Doncaster races, to meet John had ceased to be easy to her, it became more difficult every time. Possibly John had found it as difficult to speak to Di as she had found it to receive him. But however that may have been, it would certainly have been impossible to divine that he was awaiting the arrival of any one to-night with the faintest degree of interest. He did not take his stand where it would be obvious that he could command a view of the door through which the guests entered. He had seen others do that on previous occasions, and had observed that the effect was not happy. Nevertheless, from the bay window where he was watching the dancing, the guests as they arrived were visible to him. He he said Lord Frederick, joining him. "'Such a row in the men's cloak-room!' Young Talbot has come as little Bo Peep, and the men would not have him in their room. Said it was improper, and tried to hustle him into the ladies' room. He's still swearing in his ulster in the passage. Why aren't you dancing? I can't. My left arm is weak since I burned it in the spring. Well, rejoined Lord Frederick, 
who as a French marquis with cane and snuff-box was one of the best-dressed figures in the room. "'You don't miss much. Onlookers see most of the game. Look at that fairy twirling with the little man in the kilt. Their skirts are just the same length. The worst part of this species of entertainment is that one cuts one's dearest friends. Someone asked me just now whether the mauvais longue was here to-night. Do not recognise the wolf in sheep's clothing. More arrivals. A Turk and a Norwegian peasant and a man in a smock-frock. And now what on earth is the creature in blue and red with a female to match? Otter Holmes, suggested John. Is it possible? Never saw it before. There goes Fremantle as a private of the blues, saluting as he's introduced instead of bowing. What a fund of humour the youth of the present day possess. Who is that breeched earwig he's dancing with? I think it is Miss Crupp's, the heiress. Ah, might have known it. That's a sort of little pill that no one takes unless it is very much guilt. Here comes the Varelst party at last. Lady Varelst has put herself together well. I wouldn't mind buying her at my valuation and selling her at her own. She hates me, that little painted saint. I always cultivate a genuine saint. I make a point of it. They may look deuce dowdy down here. They generally do, though I believe it is only their wings under their clothes. But they will probably form the aristocracy up yonder, and it is well to know them beforehand. But Lady Varelse is a sham, and I hate shams. I am sham myself. <laughs> when last I met her she talked pious and implied intimacy with the Almighty, till at last I told her that it was the vulgarest thing in life to be always dragging in your swell acquaintance. <laughs> I shall go and speak to her directly she is done introducing her party. Mrs. Dunderson, well, I don't know the other woman. Who is the girl in white? Miss Everard. What? Hemsworth's sister? Then he'll be here too, probably. Oh, I like Hemsworth. There's no more harm in that young man than there is in a tablet of pear's soap. A crowned head next. Why, it's Di Tempest. By George, she's handsomer every time I see her. If that girl knew how to advertise herself, she might become a professional beauty. Heaven forbid, said John involuntarily, watching Di with the intense concentration of one who has long pored over memory's dim portrait, and now corrects it by the original. Lord Frederick did not see the look. For once something escaped him. He too was watching Di, who with the remainder of the Varelst party was being drifted towards them by a strong current of fresh arrivals in their wake. The usual general recognition and non-recognition peculiar to fancy balls ensued, in which old acquaintances looked blankly at each other, gasped each other's names, and then shook hands effusively, amid which one small greeting between two people who had seen and recognised each other from the first instant took place, and was over in a moment. "'I cannot recognise any one, said Di. Her head held a shade higher than usual looking round the room and saying to herself, "'He would not have spoken to me if he could have helped it.' "'Some of the people are unrecognisable,' said John, with originality equal to hers, and stung by the conviction that she had tried to avoid shaking hands with him. The music struck up suddenly, as if it were a new idea. "'Are you engaged for this dance?' said Mr. Lumley, flying to her side. Uh, "'Yes,' said Di, with decision. "'So am I,' said he, and was gone again. Dance, said a sporting times, rushing up in turn and shooting out the one word like a pea from a pop gun. Thanks, I should like to, but I'm not allowed, said Di. My grandmother is very particular. If you'd been the Sunday at home, I should have been charmed. The pink un expostulated vehemently and said he would have come as the church times if he'd only known. But Di remained firm. John walked away, pricking himself with his little dagger the sheath of which had somehow got lost, and watched the knot of men who gradually gathered round Di. Presently she moved away with Lord Frederick in the direction of Madeline, who had installed herself at the further end of the room among the fenders, as our latter-day youth gracefully designates the tiaras of the chaperones. John was seized upon and introduced to an elderly minister with an order, who told him he had known his father, and began to sound him as to his political views. John, who was inured to this form of address, answered somewhat vaguely. From that moment Di began to dance. 
She had a partner worthy of her in the shape of a sedate young Russian, resplendent in the white and gold uniform of the imperial garde à cheval. Lord Frederick gravitated back to John. No young man among the former's large acquaintance was given the benefit of his experience more liberally than John. Lord Frederick took an interest in him which was neither returned nor repelled. "'Alva is down at last,' he said. "'It seems he had to wait till his mother's maid could be spared to sew him into his clothes. "'It's a pity you're not dancing, John. "'You might dance with your cousin. "'She and Prince Blazinski make a splendid couple. "'What a crowd of moths round that candle! "'I hope you're not one of them. "'It's not the candle that gets singed. Ah, "'Another set of arrivals. "'Look at Carruthers coming in with a bouquet. "'Cox of the monarch still, I suppose. "'He can't dance with it.' No, he's given it to his father to hold. Supper at last. I must go and take someone in. John took Miss Everard in to supper. In spite of her brother's and Di's efforts, she had not danced much. She did not find him so formidable as she expected, and before supper was over had told him all about her doves, and how the grey one sat on her shoulder, and how she loved poetry better than anything in the world except Donovan. John proved a sympathetic listener. He, in his turn, confided to her his difficulty in conveying soup over the edge of his ruff, and, after providing her with a pink cream, judging with intuition unusual to his sex that a pink cream is ever more acceptable to young ladyhood than a white one, he took her back to the ballroom. The crowd had thinned. The kilt and the fairy and a few other couples were careering wildly in open space. John looked round in vain for Madeline, to whom he could deliver up his snowflake, and, catching sight of Mrs. Dundas on the chaperone's dais, made in her direction. Di, who was sitting with Mrs. Dundas, suddenly perceived them coming up the room together. What was it? What could it be, that indescribable feeling that went through her like a knife, as she saw Miss Everard on John's arm, smiling at something he was saying to her? Had they been at supper together all this long time? "'What a striking face your cousin has,' said Mrs. Dundas. "'I do not wonder that people ask who he is. I used to think him rather alarming, but Miss Everard does not seem to find him so.' "'He can be alarming,' said Di lightly. "'You should see him when he is discussing his country's wheel, or welcoming his guests.' "'Why did I say that?' she asked herself the moment the words were out of her mouth. It's ill-natured and not it true. Why did I say it? Mrs. Dundas laughed. It's the old story, she said. One never sees the virtues of one's relations. Now, as he is not my first cousin, I am able to perceive that he is a very remarkable person with a jaw that means business. There is tenacity and strength of purpose in his face. He would be a terrible person to oppose. Di laughed, but she quailed inwardly. "'I am told he is immensely run after,' continued Mrs. Dundas. "'I dare say you know,' in a whisper, "'that the Duchess wants him for Lady Alice, "'and they say he has given her encouragement, but I don't believe it. "'Anyhow, her mother is making her read up political economy in vain, poor girl. "'It must be an appalling fate to marry a great intellect. "'I am thankful to say Charlie only had two ideas in his head. "'One was chemical manures, and the other was to marry me.' "'Well, Miss Everard, Lady Verelst is at supper, but I will extend a wing over you till she returns. Here comes a crowd from the supper-room. Now, Miss Tempest, do go in. You owned you were hungry a minute ago, though you refused the tragic entreaties of the Turk and the stage villain.' "'I was afraid,' said Di, "'for though the villain is my esteemed friend in private life, I know his wide hat or the turban of the infidel would catch in my crown and drag it from my head.' I wish I had not come so regally. I enjoyed sewing penny rubies into my crown and making the ermine out of an old black muff and some rabbit fur. But uneasy is the head that wears a crown. "'I am very harmless and inaggressive,' said John, in his most level voice. "'The only person I prick with my little dagger is myself. If you are hungry, I think you may safely go into supper with me.' "'Very well,' said Di, rising and taking his offered arm. I am too famished to refuse. She is taller than he is, 
said Miss Everard, as they went together down the rapidly filling room. "'No, my dear, it's only her crown. They are exactly the same height.' No one is more useful in everyday life than the man, seldom a rich man, who can command two sixpences and can in an emergency produce a threepenny bit and some coppers. The capitalist with his half-crown is nowhere, for the time. In conversation, small change is everything. Who does not know the look of the clever man in society, conscious of a large banking account, but uncomfortably conscious also that, like Goldsmith, he has not a sixpence of ready money? And who has not envied the fool, jingling his few halfpence on a tombstone, or anywhere, to the satisfaction of himself and everyone else? Thrice blessed is small talk. But between some persons it is an impossibility, though each may have a very respectable stock of his own. Like different coinages, they will not amalgamate. Di and John have not wanted any in talking to each other, till now. And now, in their hour of need, to the alarm of both, they found they were destitute. After a short mental struggle they succumbed into the abyss of the commonplace, the only neutral ground on which those who have once been open and sincere with each other can still meet, to the certain exasperation of both. John was dutifully attentive. He procured a fresh bottle of champagne for her, and an unnibbled roll, and made suitable remarks at intervals. But her sense of irritation increased. Something in his manner annoyed her. And yet it was only the same courteous, rather expressionless manner that she remembered was habitual to him towards others. Now that it was gone, she realized that there had once been a subtle difference in his voice and bearing to herself. She felt defrauded of she knew not what, and the wing of cold pheasant before her loomed larger and larger till it seemed to stretch over the whole plate. Why on earth had she said she was hungry? And why had he brought her to the large table there was so much light and noise and where she was elbowed by an enormous hairy buffalo bill when she had seen as she came in that one of the little tables for two was at that instant vacant? She forgot that when she first caught sight of it she had said within herself that she would never forgive him if he had the bad taste to entrap her into a tete-a-tete -tete by taking her there. But he had shown at once that he had no such intention. Was this dignified, formal man, with his air of distinction and his harsh, immobile face and his black velvet dress, was this stranger really the John with whom she had been on such easy terms six weeks ago, the John who, pale and determined, had measured swords with her in the dusk of a September evening? And as she sat beside him in the brilliant light, amid the babel of tongues, a voice in her heart said suddenly, That was not the end. That was only the beginning. Only the beginning. Her eyes met his, fixed inquiringly upon hers. He was only offering her some grapes, but it appeared to her that he must have heard the words, and a sense of impotent terror seized her, as the terror of one who, wrestling for his life, finds at the first throw that he is overmatched. She rose hastily, and asked to go back to the ballroom. He complied at once, but did not speak. They went, a grave and silent couple, through the hall and down the gallery. "'Have I annoyed you?' he said at last, as they neared the ballroom. She did not answer. "'I mean, have I done anything more that has annoyed you?' "'Nothing more, thanks.' "'I'm glad,' said John. "'I feared I had. Of course, I would have not asked you to go in to supper with me if Mrs. Duntas had not obliged me. I intended to ask you to do so.' when you could have made some excuse for refusing if you did not wish it. I was sorry to force your hand. "'You will never do that,' said Di, to her own astonishment. It seemed to her that she was constrained by a power stronger than herself to defy him. She felt him start. "'We will take another turn,' he said instantly. And before she had the presence of mind to resist, they had turned and were walking slowly down the gallery again, between the rows of life-size figures of knights and chargers in armour, which loomed gigantic in the feeble light. A wave of music broke in the distance, and the few couples sitting in recesses rose and passed them on their way back to the ballroom, leaving the gallery deserted. 
a peering moon had laid a faint criss-cross whiteness on the floor. The place took a new significance. Each was at first too acutely conscious of being alone with the other to speak. She wondered if he could feel how her hand trembled on his arm, and he, whether it was possible, she did not hear the loud hammering of his heart. Either would have died rather than have betrayed their emotion to the other. "'You tell me I shall never force your hand,' he repeated slowly at last. "'No, indeed, I trust I never shall. But when, may I ask, have I shown any intention of doing so?' Di had put herself so palpably and irretrievably in the wrong that she had no refuge left but silence. She was horror-struck by his repetition of the words which her lips, but surely not she herself, had spoken. "'If you ever marry me,' said John, "'it will be of your own accord. If you don't, we shall both miss happiness, you as well as I, for we are meant for each other.' Most people are so constituted that they can marry whom they please. But you and I have no choice. We have a claim upon each other. I recognize yours with thankfulness. I did not know life held anything so good. You ignore mine and willfully turn away from it. I don't wonder. I am not a man whom any woman would choose, much less you. It is natural on your part to dislike me, at first. In the meanwhile, you need not distress yourself by telling me so. I am under no delusion on that point. His voice was firm and gentle. If it had been cold, Di's pride would have flamed up in a moment. As it was, its gentleness, under great and undeserved provocation, made her writhe with shame. She spoke impulsively. But I am distressed. I can't help being so having spoken so harshly, no, worse than harshly, so unpardonably. "'There is no question of pardon between you and me,' said John, turning to look at her with a grave smile that seemed for a moment to bring back her old friend to her, but only for a moment. His eyes contradicted it. "'I know you have never forgiven me for telling you that I loved you, but nevertheless you see I have not asked pardon yet.' though I had not intended to annoy you by speaking of it again, at present. No, said Di eagerly, but that is just it. it. It was my own fault this time. I brought it on myself. But but I can't help knowing. I, I feel directly I see you that you are still thinking of it, and then I become angry and say dreadful things like— Exactly, said John, nodding. Because I— not only because I am ill-tempered, but because though I do like being liked— Still, I don't want you or anyone to make a mistake, or, or go on making it. it. It doesn't seem fair. Not if it really is a mistake. It is in this instance. Not on my part. There was a short silence. Di felt as if she had walked up against a stone wall. John, she said with decision, believe me, I sometimes mean what I say, and I mean it now. I really and truly... I'm a person who knows my own mind. So do I, said John. Rather a longer silence. And, and, oh, John, don't you see how wretched, how foolish it is, our being on these absurd, formal terms? Have you forgotten what friends we used to be? I, I've not. It makes me angry still when I think how you've taken yourself away for nothing, and how all the pleasure is gone out of meeting you or talking to you. I don't think you half knew how much I liked you. Die, said John, stopping short and facing her with indignation in his eyes. I desire that you will never again tell me you like me. I really cannot stand it. Let us go back to the ballroom. End of Volume 2 Chapter 12 Volume 2, Chapter 13 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 2, Chapter 13 Ah, man's pride, or woman's, which is the greatest. Elizabeth Barrett Browning Die, said Archie, sauntering up to her on the terrace at Cantaloupe, where she was sitting the morning after the ball, and planting himself in front of her, 
as he had a habit of doing before all women, so as to spare them the trouble of turning round to look at him. "'I can't swallow little crumbs.' "'No one wants you to,' said Di. "'If you don't like her, you'd better leave her alone.' "'Women are not meant to be let alone,' said Archie, yawning, "'except the ugly ones.' "'Well, Miss Crupps is not pretty.' "'No, but she's gilt up to the eyes. Poor eyes, too, and light eyelashes. I couldn't marry light eyelashes.' "'I'm glad to hear it. Oh, I know you don't care a straw whether I settle well or not. You never have cared. Women are all alike. There's not a woman in the world, or a man either, who cares a straw what becomes of me.' "'Or you, what becomes of them?' "'John's just as bad as the rest.' continued the victim of a worldly age. And John and I were great chums in old days. But it's the way of the world. Men who attract by a certain charm of manner which the character is unable to bear out, who make unconscious promises to the hope of others without ability to keep them, are ever those who complain most loudly of the fickleness of women, of the uncertainty of friendship, of their loveless lot. Di did not answer. Any allusion to John, even the bare mention of his name, had become of moment to her. She never by any chance spoke of him, neither did she ever miss a word that was said about him in her presence, and often raged inwardly at the ruthless judgments and superficial criticisms that were freely passed upon him by his contemporaries, and especially his kinsfolk. From a very early date in this world's history, ability has been felt to be distressing in its own country, especially in the country. If a clever man would preserve unflawed the amulet of humility, let him at intervals visit among his country cousins. John had not many of these invaluable relations, but, happily for him, he had contemporaries who did just as well, men who, when he was mentioned with praise in their hearing, could always break in that they known him at Eton, and relate how he had overeaten himself of the sock-shop. "'One thing I am determined I won't do,' continued Archie, "'and that is marry poverty, like the poor old governor. "'He's often talked about it, and what a grind it was, with the tears in his eyes.' "'What has turned your mind to marriage on this particular morning of all others?' "'Oh, I don't know, that it is the vision of little crops. "'I suppose I shall come to something of that kind some day. "'If it isn't her, it'll be something like her. "'One must live.' You are on the lookout for money too, Di, so you need not be so disdainful. You can't marry a poor man. They don't often ask me, said Di. I fancy I look more expensive to keep up than I really am. Ah, here comes Lady Verelst, said Archie, patronizingly. I'd marry her now if she were a rich widow. I would indeed. She's putting up her red parasol. Quite right. She's not your complexion, Di, nor mine either. Archie got up as Madeline came towards them, and offered her his chair. Archie had several cheap effects. To offer a chair with a glance and a smile was one of them. Perhaps he could not help it if the glance suggested unbound homage, if the smile conveyed an admiration as concentrated as Liebig's extract. His faithful, tender eyes could wear the sweetest, the saddest, or the most reproachful expression to order. Every slight passing feeling was magnified by the beauty of the face that reflected it into a great emotion. He felt almost nothing, but he appeared to feel a great deal. A man who possesses this talisman is very dangerous. Poor Madeline, confident of her appearance in her new cresser garment, with its gold-flowered waistcoat, firmly believed, as Archie silently pushed forward the chair, that she had inspired had been so unfortunate as to inspire en grande passion malheureuse. Almost all Archie's love-making, and that is saying a good deal, was speechless. He could look unutterable things, but he had not, as he himself expressed it, the gift of the gab. Madeline was sorry for him, but she could not allow him to remain enraptured beside her in full view of Henry's study windows. "'How delicious it is here!' she said, after dismissing him to the billiard-room. "'I never lie in bed after a ball. Do you, die? I seem to crave for the sunshine and the face of nature after all the glitter and the worldliness of a ballroom.' "'I don't find ballrooms more worldly than other places, than this bench, for instance.' "'Now, how strange that is of you, die! 
This spot is quite sacred to me. I come and read here. Madeline had, by degrees, sanctified all the seats in the garden, had taken the impious chill even off the iron ones, by reading her little manuals on each in turn. It was here, continued Madeline, that I persuaded dear Fred to go into the church. It was settled he was to be a clergyman ever since he had that slight stroke as a boy. But when he went to college he must have got into a bad set, for he said he did not think he had a vocation. And mother, you know what mother is, did not like to press it, and the whole thing was slipping through when I had him to stay here and talk to him very seriously and explain that a living in the family was the call. Madeline, said Di, rising precipitately, it's getting late. I must fly and pack. If she stayed another moment, she knew she would inevitably say something that would scandalise Madeline. And I did not say it, she said with modest triumph that evening, as she sat in her grandmother's room before going to bed, having rejoined her at Garston, a relative's house, whither Mrs. Courtney had preceded her. I refrained even from bad words. Granny, you know everything. Why is it that the people who shock me so dreadfully, like Madeline, are just the very ones who are shocked at me? You are not. All the really good, earnest people I know are not. But they are. What's the matter with them? Oh, my dear, what is the matter with all insincere people? It is only one of the symptoms of an incurable disease. But the being shocked is genuine. They really feel it. There is something wrong somewhere, but I don't know where it is. It is not hard to find, I, said Mrs. Courtney sadly, and it is not worth growing hot about. You are only running a little tilt against religiosity. Most young persons do. But it is not worth powder and shot. Keep your ammunition for a nobler enemy. There is plenty of sin in the world. Strike at that whenever you can, but don't pop away at shadows. Ah, oh, but, Granny, these people do such harm. They bring such discredit on religion. "'Tis what enrages me. "'My dear, you are wrong. "'They bring discredit upon nothing "'but their own lamentable caricatures of holy things. "'These people are solemn warnings, "'danger signals on the broad paths of religiosity, "'which, remember, are very easy walking. "'There's no life so easy. "'The religious life is hard enough, God knows. "'Providence put those people there to make their creed hideous, "'and they do it. Upon my word, I think your indignation against them is positively unpardonable. Di was silent. You don't mind being disliked by these creatures, do you, Di? Yes, Granny, I think I do. I believe, if I only knew the truth about myself, I want every one to like me. And it ruffles me because they make round eyes and don't like me when their superiors often do. Mere pride and love of admiration on your part, my dear. You have no business with them. To be liked and admired by certain persons is a stigma in itself. Look at the kind of mediocrity and feebleness they set on pedestals, and be thankful you don't fit into their mutual admiration societies. That like cleaves to like is a saying we seldom get to the bottom of. These unfortunates find blots, faults, evil in everything, especially everything original, because they are sensitive to blots and faults. They commit themselves out of their own mouths. Those that seek shall find is especially true of the fault-finders. The truth and beauty which others receptive of truth and beauty perceive escape them. Good nature sees good in others. The reverent impute reverence. This false reverence finds irreverence, as a mean nature takes for granted a low motive in its fellow. Oh, dear me, Di, have I expended on you for years the wisdom of a Socrates and a Solomon, that at one and twenty you should need to be taught your alphabet? Go to bed and pray for wisdom instead of complaining of the lack of it in others. Di had had but little leisure lately, and the unbounded leisure of her long visit at Garston came as a relief. I shall have time to think here, she said to herself, as she looked out the first morning over the grey park and lake, distorted by the little panes of old glass of her low window. Two very old people lived at Garston, who regarded their niece, Mrs. Courtney, as still quite a young person, in spite of her tall granddaughter. Time seemed to have forgotten the dear old couple, and they, in turn, had forgotten it. It never mattered what time of day it was, 
Nothing depended on the hour. In the course of the morning the butler would open both the folding doors at the end of the long parlour leading to the chapel, and would announce, "'Prayers are served.' Long prayers they were. Long meals were served, too, with long intervals between them, during which, in spite of a week of heavy rain, Di escaped regularly into the gardens, and so away to the park. The house oppressed her. She was restless and ill at ease. She was never missed, because she was never wanted. And she wandered for hours in the park, listening to the low cry of the deer, standing on the bridge over the artificial 1745 lake, or pacing mile on mile a sheltered path under the park wall. The thinking for which she had such ample opportunity did not come off. It shirked regularly. A certain vague trouble of soul was upon her, like the unrest of nature at the spring of the year. And, day after day, she watched the autumn leaves drop from the trees into the water, and there was a great silence in her heart, and underneath the silence a fear. Or was it hope? She knew not. There was one subject to which Di's thoughts returned, and ever returned, in spite of herself. John was that subject. Gradually, as the days wore on, her shamed remorse at having wounded him gave place to the old animosity against him. She had never been angry with any of her numerous lovers before. She had, on the contrary, been rather sorry for them. But she was desperately angry with John. It seemed to her, why she would have been at a loss to explain, that he had taken a very great liberty in venturing to love her, and in daring to assert that they were suited to each other. She went through silent paroxysms of rage against him, sitting on a fallen tree among the bracken with clenched hands. Her sense of his growing power over her, over her thought, over her will, was intolerable. Why so fierce? Why such a fool? she asked herself over and over again. He could not marry her against her will. Indeed, he said he did not want to. Why, then, all this silly indignation about nothing? There was no answer, until one day Mrs. Courtney happened to mention to Mrs. Garston, in her presence, the probability of John's eventually marrying Lady Alice Fane. A very charming and suitable person, etc. Then suddenly it became clear to Di that, though she would never marry him herself, the possibility of his marrying any one else was not to be borne for a moment. John, of course, was to, was to remain unmarried all his life. Her sense of the ludicrous showed her in a lightning flash where she stood. To discover a new world is all very well for people like Columbus, who want to find one. But to discover a new world by mistake when quite content with the old one, and to be swept towards it, uncertain of your reception by the natives assembling on the beach, is another thing altogether. For the second time in her life, Di was frightened. Then all these horrible feelings are, are being in love, she said to herself, with a sense of stupefaction. This is what other people have felt for me, and I treat it as of little consequence. This is what I have read about and sung about and always rather wished to feel. I am in love with John. Oh, I hope to God he will never find it out. Probably no man will ever understand the agonies of humiliation, of furious, unreasoning antagonism, which a proud woman goes through when she becomes aware that she is falling in love. Pride and love go as ill together in the beginning as they go exceeding well together later on. To be loved is incense at first, until the sense of justice, fortunately rare in women, is aroused. Shall I take all and give nothing? Pride, often a very tender pride for the lover himself, asks that question. Directly it is asked, the battle begins. I will not give less than all. How can I give all? The very young are spared the conflict because the future husband is regarded only as the favoured ball partner, the perpetual admirer of a new existence. But women who know something of life, of the great demands of marriage, of the absolute sacrifice of individual existence which it involves, when they begin to tremble beneath the sway of a deep human passion, suffer much, fear greatly, until the perfect love comes that casts out fear. 
Some natures, and very lovable they are, give all, counting not the cost. Others, a very few, count the cost, and then give all. Die was one of these. End of Volume 2, Chapter 13 Volume 2, Chapter 14 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 2, Chapter 14 Verity in women is sometimes the accompaniment of a rare power of loving, and when it is so their attachment is strong as death, their fidelity at resisting as the diamond. Amiel The newspapers arrived at tea-time at Garston, Every afternoon Mrs. Garston and Mrs. Courtney drove out along the straight high road to fetch the papers and post the letters, four miles in and four miles out, the grey pair one day and the bays the next, in the old yellow chariot. It was the rule of the house. And after tea and rusks and a poached egg under a cover for Mr. Garston, gentlemen read the papers aloud in a voice that trembled and halted like the spinet in the southern parlour. "'Is Parliament prorogued yet?' Mrs. Garston asked regularly every afternoon. Mr. Garston, without answering, struck his keynote at the berths, and quavered slowly through the marriages and deaths. Before he had arrived on this particular afternoon, at the fact that Princess Beatrice had walked with Prince Henry of Battenberg, Mrs. Garston was already nodding between her little rows of white curls. Mrs. Courtney was awake, but she looked too solemnly attentive to continue in one's day. "'The remains of the Dean of Gloucester,' continued Mr. Garston, "'will be interred at Gloucester Cathedral on Friday next.' The information was received, like most sedatives, without comment. Latest intelligence, colliery explosion at Snarley. "'Die, had not John Culpits at Snarley?' asked Mrs. Courtney, becoming suddenly wide awake. "'Yes,' said Di. "'Explosion of fire-damp.' continued Mr. Garston, slower than ever. "'No particulars known. Great loss of life apprehended. Mr. Tempest of Overley, to whom the mind belonged, instantly left Godalmington Court, where he was the guest of Lord Caradoc, and proceeded at once to the spot where he organised a rescue party led by himself. Mr. Tempest was the first to descend the shaft. The gravest anxiety was felt respecting the fate of the rescuing party. Vast crowds assembled at the pit's mouth. No further news obtainable out to date of going to press. Mrs. Courtney looked at Di. He must be mad to have gone down himself, she said agitatedly. What could he possibly do there? His duty, said Di, and she got up and left the room. How could anyone exist in that hot, close atmosphere? She was suffocating. The hall was cold enough. She shivered as she crossed it, and went up the white shadow stairs to her own room, where a newly lit fire was spluttering. She knelt down before it and pushed a burning stick further between the bars, blackening her fingers. It would catch the paper at the side now. John had gone down the shaft. Yes, it would catch. The paper stretched itself and flared up. She went and stood by the window. "'John has gone down,' she said, half aloud. Her heart was quite numb. Only her body seemed to care. Her limbs trembled, and she sat down on the narrow window-seat, her hands clutching the dragon hasp of the window, her eyes looking absently out. There was a fire in the west. Upon the dreaming land the dreaming mists lay pale. The sentinel trees stood motionless and dark, each folded in his mantle of grey. Only the water waked and knew its god. And, far across the sleeping land, in the long lines of flooded meadow, the fire trembled on the upturned face of the water, like the reflection of the divine glory in a passionate human soul. It passed. The light throbbed and died, but died did not stir. And as she sat motionless, her mind slipped sharp and keen out of its lethargy and restlessness, like a sword from its scabbard. Now, at this moment, is he alive or dead? and at the thought of death, that holiest minister who waits on life, all the rebellious anger, all the nameless fierce resentment against her lover, because he was her lover, 
fell from her like a garment, died down like Peter's lies at the cross of Christ. The evening deepened its mourning for the dead day. One star shook in the empty sky above the shadow and the mist. Love the gift is love the debt. And I perceived that at last. A great shame fell upon her for the divided feelings, the unconscious struggle with her own heart of the last few weeks. It appeared to her now ignoble, as all elementary phases of feeling, all sheaths of deep affection must appear, in the moment when that which they enfolded and protect grows beyond the narrow confines which it no longer needs. If he is dead, Di twisted her hands. Who, one of two that had loved and stood apart, has escaped that pang if death intervene? A moment ago and the world was full of messengers waiting to speed between them at the slightest bidding. A penny stamp could do it. But there was no bidding. A moment more, and all communication is cut off. No armada can cross that sea. Perhaps he is dying, and I sit here, she said. I would give my life for him, and I cannot do a hand's turn. And she rocked herself to and fro. For the first time in her life Di dashed herself blindly against one of God's boundaries, and the shock that a first realization of her helplessness always brings struck her like a blow. She could do nothing. Many impulsive people, under the intolerable pressure of their own impotence, make a feverish pretense of action and turn stones and pebbles as they cannot turn heaven and earth. But Di was not impulsive. And the gong sounded, first far away in the western wing, and then at the foot of the staircase. Many things fail us in this world. Youth, love, friendship, take to themselves wings. But meals are not among our migratory joys. Amid the shifting quicksands of life, they stand fast as milestones. Di dressed and went downstairs. It seemed years since she had last seen the parlour, an old Mr. Garston standing alone before the fire. He did not appear aged. "'It's later than it was,' he remarked, and she had a dim recollection that in some misty bygone time he invariably used to say those words every evening, and that she used to smile and nod and say, "'Yes, Uncle George.' And so she smiled now, and repeated like a parrot, "'Yes, Uncle George.' And he said, "'Yes, Diana, yes.' Breakfast was later than usual next morning. It always is when one has lain awake all night. But it ended at last, and I was at last at liberty to rush up to her room, pull on an old waterproof and felt hat, and dart out unobserved into the rain. The white mist closed in upon her, and directly she was out of sight of the house she began to run. There were no aimless wanderings and pacings to-day. Oh, the relief of rapid movement after the long inertia of the night! the joy of feeling the rain sweeping against her face. She did not know the way, but she could not miss it. It was only four miles off. It was eleven now. The morning papers would be in by this time. If she walked hard, she would be back by luncheon time. And in truth, a few minutes before two, Di emerged from her room in the neatest and driest of blue serge gowns. Only her hair, which curled more crisply than usual, showed that she had been out in the damp. She had come home dead beat and wet to the skin, but she had hardly known it. A new climbing, agitated joy pulsated in her heart, in the presence of which cold and fatigue did could not exist, in the presence of which no other feeling can exist, for the time. "'Are you glad John is out of danger?' said Mrs. Courtney that evening as they went upstairs together, after Mr. Garston had read of John's narrow escape. John had been one of the few among the rescuing party who had returned. "'Very glad,' said Di, and she was on the point of telling her grandmother of her expedition that morning, when a sudden novel sensation of shyness seized her, and she stopped short. Mrs. Courtney sighed as she settled herself for her nap before dinner. "'Has she inherited her father's heartlessness as well as his yellow hair?' she asked herself. Mrs. Courtney had lived long enough to know how few and far between are those among our fellow-creatures whose hearts are not entirely engrossed by the function of their own circulation. 
Youth believes in universal warmth of heart. It is as common as rhubarb in April. Later on we discern that easily touched feelings, youth's dearest toys, are but toys, shaped stones that look like bread. Later on we discern how fragile is the woof of sentiment to bear the wear and tear of life. Later still, when sorrow chills us, we learn on how few amid the many hearths where we are welcome guests, a fire burns to which we may stretch our cold hands and find warmth and comfort. End of Volume 2, Chapter 14 Volume 3, Chapter 1 of Diana Tempest by Mary Chumley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Volume 3, Chapter 1 Time and Chance are but a tide. Burns. Between aspiration and achievement there is no great gulf fixed. God does not mock his children by putting a lying spirit in the mouth of their prophetic instincts. Only the faith of concentrated endeavour, only the stern years which must hold fast the burden of a great hope, only the patience, strong and meek, which is content to bow beneath the fatigue of a long and distant purpose, only these stepping-stones, and no gulf impassable by human feet, divide aspiration from achievement. To aspire is to listen to the word of command. To achieve is to obey, and to continue to obey that voice. It is given to all to aspire. Few allow themselves to achieve. John had begun to see that. If he meant to achieve anything, it was time he put his hand to the plough. He had listened and learned long enough. "'My time has come.' he said to himself, as he sat alone in the library at Overley on the first day of the new year. I am twenty-eight. I have been promising long enough. The time of promise is past. I must perform, or the time of performance will pass me by. He knit his heavy brows. I must act, he said to himself, and I cannot act. I must work, and I cannot work. Tom was conscious of having had, he still had, high ambitions, deep enthusiasms. Yet, lo, all his life seemed to hinge on the question whether Di would become his wife. Who was not experienced, almost with a sense of traitorship to his own nature, how the noblest influences at work upon it may be caught up into the loom of an all-absorbing personal passion, adding a new beauty and dignity to the fabric, but nevertheless changing for the time the pattern of the life? John's whole heart was set on one object. There is a rubicon in the feelings to pass which is to cut off retreat. John had long passed it. "'I cannot do two things at the same time,' he said. "'I will ask Mrs. Courtney and Di here for the hunt-ball, and settle matters one way or the other with Di. After that, whether I succeed or fail, I will throw myself heart and soul into the career that is prophesied for me. The general election comes on in the spring. I'll stand then.' John wrote a letter to the minister who had such a high opinion of him, or perhaps of his position, preserved a copy, pigeonholed it, and put it from his mind. His thoughts reverted to Di as a matter of course. He had seen her several times since the fancy ball. Each particular of those meetings was noted down in the unwritten diary which contains all that is of interest in our lives, which no friend need be entreated to burn at our departure. He was aware that a subtle change had come about between him and I, that they had touched new ground. If he had been in love before, which of course he ought to have been, he would have understood what that change meant. As it was, he did not. No doubt he would be wiser next time. Yet even John, creeping mole-like through self-made labyrinths of conjecture one inch below the surface, asked himself, whether it was credible that Di was actually beginning to care for him. When he knew for certain she did not, there seemed no reason that she should not. Now that he was insane enough to imagine she might, he was aware of a thousand deficiencies in himself which made it impossible. And yet... So he wrote another letter, this time to Mrs. Courtney, inviting her and Di to the Hunt Ball in his neighbourhood at the end of January. And his invitation was accepted and one, if not two persons, 
perhaps even a third old enough to know better, began the unprofitable task of counting days. It was an iron winter. It affected Fritz's health deleteriously. His short legs raised him but little above the surface of the earth, and he was subject to chills and cramps owing to the constant contact of the under portion of his long ginger person with the snow. Not that there was much snow. One steel and iron frost succeeded another. Lindo, on the contrary, found the cold slight compared with the two winters which he had passed in Russia with John. His wool had been allowed to grow, to the great relief of Mitty, who could not abide the bareback state which the exigencies of fashion required of him during the summer. It was a winter not to be forgotten, a winter such as the oldest people at Overley could hardly recall. As the days in the new year lengthened, the frost strengthened, as the saying goes. The village beck at Overley froze. By and by the great rivers froze. Carts went over the Thames. Someone, fonder of driving than of horses, drove a four-in-hand on the ice at Oxford. The long lake below Overley Castle, which had formerly supplied the moat, was frozen feet thick. The little islands and the boathouse were lapped in ice. It became barely possible, as the days went on, to keep one end open for the swans and ducks. The herons came to divide the open space with them. Great frost of 1821 was not one that would be quickly forgotten. John kept open house, for the ice at Overley was the best in the neighbourhood, and all the neighbours within distance thronged to it. Mothers drove over with their daughters, for skating is a healthy pursuit, and those that can't skate can learn. The most inaccessible hunting men, rendered desperate like the herons by the frost, turned up regularly at Overley to play hockey, or emulate John's figure-skating, which by reason of long practice in Russia was bad to beat. John was a conspicuous figure on the ice, in his furred Russian coat lined with sable paws, in which he had skated at the ice carnivals at St. Petersburg. Mitty, with bright winter apple cheeks and a splendid new beaver muff, would come down to watch her darling wheel and sweep. "'If the frost holds, I will have an ice carnival when Di is here,' John said to himself, and after that he watched the glass carefully. The day of Di's arrival drew near came, and actually die with it. She was positively in the house. Archie came the same day, but not with her. Archie had invariably shown such a marked propensity for travelling by any train except that previously agreed upon, when he was depended on to escort his sister, that after a long course of irritation Mrs. Courtney had ceased to allow him to chaperone die, to the disgust of that gentleman, who was very proud of his ornamental sister, when she was not in the way and who complained bitterly at not being considered good enough to take her out. So Mrs. Courtney, who had accepted for the sake of appearances, but who had never had the faintest intention of leaving her own fireside in such inhuman weather, discovered a tendency to bronchitis, and failed at the last moment, confiding Di to the charge of Miss Fane, who good-naturedly came down from London to assist John in entertaining his guests. And still the following day the frost held. The hunt-ball had dwindled to nothing in comparison with the ice-carnival at Overley the night following the ball. The whole neighbourhood was ringing with it. Such a thing had never taken place within the memory of man at Overley. The neighbours, the tenantry, cottagers and all were invited. The hockey-players rejoiced in the rumour that there would be hockey by torchlight, with goals lit up by flambeau and a phosphorescent bun. Would the frost hold? That was the burning topic of the day. There was a large house-party at Overley, a throng of people who in Di's imagination existed only during certain hours of the day, and melted into the walls at other times. They came and went, and skated and laughed, and wore beautiful furs, especially Lady Alice Fane, but they had no independent existence of their own. The only real people among the crowd of dancing skating shadows were herself and John, with whom all that first day she had hardly exchanged a word. To her relief, was it, or her disappointment? After tea she went up with Miss Fane to the low entresol room, which had been set apart for that lady's use, to help her to rearrange the men's buttonholes, which John had pronounced to be too large. As soon as Di took them in hand, Miss Fane, of course, discovered, 
as was the case, that she was doing them far better than she could herself, and presently trotted off on the pretext of seeing to some older lady who did not want seeing to, and did not return. Di was not sorry. She arranged the bunches of lilies of the valley at leisure, glad of the quiet interval after a long and unprofitable day. Presently the person of whom she happened to be thinking happened to come in. He would have been an idiot if he had not, though I regret to be obliged to chronicle that he had had doubts on the subject. "'I thought I should find Aunt Lou here,' he said, rather guiltily, for falsehood sat ungracefully upon him. And he looked round the apartment as if she might be concealed in a corner. "'She was here a moment ago,' said Di, and she began to assault the flowers all over again. "'The frost shows no signs of giving.' "'I am glad.' After the frost John found nothing further of equal originality to say, and presently he sat down, neither near to her nor very far away, with his chin in his hands, watching her wire her flowers. The shaded light dealt gently with the folds of Di's amber tea-gown, and touched the lowest ripple of her yellow hair. She dropped a single lily, and he picked it up for her, and laid it on her knee. It was a day of little things, the little things love glorifies. He did not know that his attitude was that of a lover, did not realise the inference he would assuredly have drawn if he had seen another man sit as he was sitting then. He had forgotten all about that. He thought of nothing, neither thought of anything in the blind, unspeakable happiness and comfort of being near each other, and at peace with each other. Afterwards, long afterwards, John remembered that hour with a feeling as of a paradise lost that had been only half realised at the time. He wondered how he had borne such happiness so easily, why no voice from heaven had warned him to speak then, or hereafter for ever hold his peace. Yet at the time it had seemed only the dawning of a coming day, the herald of a more sure and perfect joy to be. The prophetic conviction had been at the moment too deep for doubt that there would be many times like that. Many times, he'd thought, lying awake through the short winter night after the ball. John had discovered that to be alternately absolutely certain of two opposite conclusions without being able to remain in either is to be in a state of doubt. He found he could bear that blister as ill as most men. I will speak to her the morning after the carnival, he said, when all this tribe of people have gone. What is the day going to be like? He got up and unbarred his shutter and looked out. The late grey morning was shivering up the sky. The stars were white with cold. The frost had wrought an ice fairyland on the lattice. While that fragile web held against the pane, the frost that wrapped the whole country would hold also. End of Volume 3, Chapter 1